go from, we don't think things through. I feel something and I react. Feel something, react. Oh, overactive amygdala. That means that, that part of our brain also has a lot to do with being the emotional response builder, filter, and it's broken. It's just been flooded with so much cortisol over the years because of this trauma response that it's just over, it's always kind of firing. And a seemingly pretty benign or neutral stimulus. Can you you have those clients, right, that go from zero to sixty? You no, know, just like you're like, whoa, where did that come from? Right? So here's my lovely um, rudimentary drawing here of the brain. So what happens to us in that normal stress response that we talked about? There's the stimulus, hits our thalamus, and floods that epinephrine and cortisol to all areas of the brain, right? So we're going to react to keep ourselves safe. But then we have um, the higher brain functions that are real healthy, that will help us slow down our reaction and kind of um, not overreact. That is the normal or average adult brain. The hypothalamic system is also really activated in these responses. The hippocampus, it's the emotional memory system of the brain. What happens with trauma, something <coughs> happens that's traumatic. That event and the emotions that go along with it are stored together in the brain. So every time this person has that same feeling, they're going to have that same reaction. It plays a really important role in memory and learning. A really important role in memory and learning. This makes our job more difficult. Because we really have to be patient. We have to do the same things for this person as we walk through recovery with them. Yes? And it tends to create expectations and situations related to reward and punishment in life. But it's all based on that, the memory and past learning, that trauma response that are stored together. <laughs> so, what else is happening? Think about it. Because it has to do, that part of the brain has to do with coming up with a new way to react to the world around you. And it's damaged in someone with trauma. So it's really difficult for them to learn new expectations and have new emotional responses to the world around them. It's kind of like a loss of emotional imagination or creativity. And they give up on creating new possibilities and get stuck in that traumatic reenactment. So this is what the brain looks like for someone who's had a lot of trauma issues. The higher thinking, processing parts of the brain are literally atrophied. Why? Because they've had such a flood from trauma of the cortisol, epinephrine, right? Keeps that floodgate open to the amygdala. So most everything's going there. So we're not thinking, we're acting. And it literally atrophies. So what we see, the evolving characteristics of someone who has a lot of trauma, everyday stressors bring on that really um, reactive, overreactive response. This person is in a persistent state of fear and hypervigilance, remember, all the time. And that rapid transition from anxiety to terror. That's all they know. So you have your general stimulus, then we have in increased aggression, and perception, you guys, perception is key. Perception is skewed. Our reality is not their reality. Because again, what do they know? They know they, they feel this way when, when they feel threatened, and it is more overwhelming than we understand. And they perceive other people's actions, and even stuff we do or that we're trying to help keep someone safe as maybe even predatory. You know, there's just a lot of skewed perception. Just remember that. Their perception is very different than ours. And then we, we are just stuck in this persistent anxiety, hypervigilance, and that environmental scanning. This is my bottom line. I'm a pretty simple person. This is a visual that I like to think of. When you're working with someone with trauma issues, I might say to you, hey, you were late for this meeting. I'm glad, I'm glad you got here but they heard that you were late for this meeting. Maybe this person got punished severely for being, ever being late from school or dinner, whatever it is. So you feel like you just kind of tossed a pebble on their shoe. It's a crushing boulder of emotions to this person. 
So again, perception, very skewed. Let's talk about this now. I want some conversation. So let's talk about the things that we can do. For instance, let me tell you a story. Megan Coggy is our new director of Pure Wellness Services. And Megan talks about, she, she has schizophrenia. She's been in and out of hospitals for many years. And she's been traumatized with the, the forced meds, seclusion and restraint, all of that. She's been very lucky. She's found some things that work, and now she's our director. And she'll say to me when we're in a meeting or something, we'll kind of have a little job. I'm getting to mingle it out, she says. I'm getting to mingle it out. She knows her amygdala is starting fire, right? And her, the very simple trick, because what we need to do is get that thinking or that reacting from here back up to here, right? So she has her own little trick. She'll start counting all the brown things in the room, counting all the green things in the room, reading the, whatever sign is hanging in front of her, something to get this prefrontal cortex working again. Okay? It's like a muscle. we got to work it out. Okay? So think about the social and environmental interventions. I know you guys are from a spectrum of different places, so talk to me about... Your environments, where you meet with your people. I meet wherever they're comfortable, period. You go to them. I go to them. Great. They can come to me, mm -hmm. but I know the majority need to feel safe, comfortable, in order to draw out that information that Absolutely. I need. So I go to them, whether it's the shower, the river, coffee shop, right outside the store, just so they don't come in the building. Right. Whatever. You get it. That's yeah. That's great. Where <clears throat> wherever someone can feel most safe. Where else? What other environments do you use? Do you have offices? Or People's homes. In their homes. Yeah. What if you can get to their place and where they live? <coughs> close your eyes for a minute and listen. Okay. Kind of be sensory sensitive. Really sensitive to the things that are going on around that person's home and living space. If it is chaotic and it is loud, and it's just filled with people, crowded, whatever, and sh the shelters I know of, that is going to interfere with their ability to learn something new. So bringing down the noise level, any you know smells that are kind of triggering from them, you know, trying to, to think about the environment and what we can do if it's too cold, if it's too hot. And like I, I have an office setting right now, and and in our programs in the houses that we have, I cannot stand the fluorescent lights because if you listen, if you close your eyes and listen, they buzz. Yeah, they have that little buzz that goes. And for somebody who's very hypersensitive, sensory wise, that's another piece of input that's interfering with them engaging <coughs> in treatment. What other social things do you, or environmental things do you think you could help affect change for your folks? It's harder when you're going to their homes, huh? Because you don't have a lot of control over that. When you're there, break down. <clears throat> bring the energy level down. And they feel safe there now, you already came to them. So then you're gonna have a lot more success in whatever you're discussing. That. So cognitive engagement is key, right? And I just I told you about Megan's trick of just counting all the brown things, counting all the green things. What are some of the things that you can do if your client is just really having a hard time engaging? Got a lot of baby voices, all these things going on, a lot of noise in their head, right? You know what that's like, right? I have days like that where there's so much just noise in my head about things I should be doing or not doing. Think about it if you have voices in there too. So what are some of the, the very simple things we can do if you get there and it's like this, it's kind of high. It's just kind of energized. You try to take them out of their environment. Try to take them away from the... If that's the stressor, yeah. Go for a walk, go outside, and get, get away from it. Engage in conversation around something that's meaningful to them. Whether it's a hobby, Whatever it is that's really meaningful to them, that will bring it back up here. And then you can ease into the treatment issues. Right? Yeah. I also find it helpful if you go into someone's home, because you know people are self-conscious when you go into their home. They find something that you think is pretty or something 
their dog is cute, and you just make sure I don't mind the dog, it's fine, I have dogs. That's that so piece of engagement, like, meeting them where they are, something that's meaningful to them. Exactly. That's, that brings my energy level down. Yeah. yeah. Makes them feel valued. Mm -hmm. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. But if you're having a hard time with someone, you need to have a conversation with you. Do they like to play cards? Play the card game. Again, getting the energy away from the amygdala and into the thinking so that they, they can then engage. But if we have someone walk in to our office or we walk into their home and sit down and just start to try to engage and, and do treatment, I mean, I need some of that time too to, to kind of calm down and bring energy down. So that is therapeutic. Use that time, just like you said. Because it's so hard for all of us even to be present um, most of the time, isn't it? Because we have so many lists in our head. And think about someone who is, has got trauma issues and they're already revved up, their CNS is already up here. So everything we can do to bring it down, take energy away. And then if you're playing card games, do something that's um, like, what is that one card game where you flip it over and try to find a match? Or concentration. concentration. <laughs> I'm not concentrating very well, am I? <laughs> I got a little noise in my head today. <laughs> but yeah, do something that helps with that, that memory piece and learning. There's also, you know, we have the psychopharmacology too, but I, to me, even though I'm a nurse, you know, I believe in that, I believe in medicine. It's not gonna do anything without all the other stuff. It's not gonna do anything without the relationships that you're building and having those conversations and finding a way in to help create new ways of responding to the world around them. You know, we've always kind of thought, all right, the thinking was, what's wrong with you? You have this, you have this. You don't have a home. You have um, been diagnosed with schizophrenia. You have this. Instead of thinking about what's wrong with you, what if we do a little paradigm shift? Wow, what's happened to you? What's your story? What's your story? And just listen to it. The easiest tool we have, right? This name. People need to tell their story. I'm not saying have them drag every detail, you know, through the mud, all of that. You know your clients. You know when you can get into some deep therapy. But let them talk for a little bit. Let them get it out. And let's be interested. Let's, the hardest thing, again, is being present. I heard a magnificent speaker yesterday. Um, her name is Laura Vanderhoot Lipsby. And... She uh, has a, a website, traumastewards.com. Write it down, go look at it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to save your life in a lot of ways. Trauma, trauma stewardship, I just started reading it last night but because I, I saw her speak yesterday, and she's fabulous. And she kind of gives us the view, we're going to talk about it a little bit here today, but about vicarious trauma. If you don't think the crises the horrible things and the stuff going on with the people that you're serving is affecting you, think again. What are some of the signs? We know about burnout, and we know it's really important to take care of ourselves. But when you get to that kind of numbing thing, or what about this? We all tell our fathers, you need to be out at the park more with your kids, and what happens when we see a man with kids at the park? What's the first thing you think? What's he up to? We think differently in this business. Our first thoughts are kind of towards that stuff, right? Dance break. <laughs> 